Hi, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and my special guest this evening is Victoria Moran. A vegan of three decades and an obesity survivor, Victoria Moran is the author of the newly released Good Karma Diet and also Main Street Vegan, as well as many other best-selling books. Her fans include Michael Moore and Ellen DeGeneres, among many others. I'm a big fan myself. And Victoria hosts the weekly Main Street Vegan podcast, directs the Main Street Vegan Academy, which is an exciting program in New York City to train and certify vegan lifestyle coaches and educators, which I'm hoping she'll tell us more about. And please welcome Victoria Moran. How you doing? Hey, I'm fabulous. Talking to you always makes me feel good. I'm so excited. You know, it's so funny because people have just been asking for you for the longest time. And it's just, it's funny how these things book up and then we had a cancellation. I was so excited you could do it. And it worked out perfectly because you have a new book. That's right. And, and it's it, pretty, too. It is pretty. I don't, you know, I ask this a lot, Victoria. I just love titles. Good, the Good Karma Diet, great title. What made you think of that title? You know, I actually thought of it several years ago. Uh, I was doing a lot of raw food one summer, and I just felt amazing. You know, sometimes you, you, you get into these little different forays in life, and they change you. And I was feeling better than I had ever felt. And it just hit me. You know what? You're eating a good karma diet. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, just being vegan, that's good karma because you're putting so much good out into the world. And then when you pair that with really giving your body what it needs on a consistent basis, you've got it all. Now, the title just sort of sat on the shelf because I, I was working on living a charmed life at that time, and then I did Main Street Vegan. But when I was looking for, gosh, what's going to come next, the Good Karma Diet was still sitting there saying, pick me, pick me, because <laughs> what this is really about is happiness. You know, we want to be healthy, but why does anybody do anything? Why, why do people eat monster cookies, and then why do they go on punitive diets because they think one or both of those things is going to make them happy. So why not skip the middle diet and go straight to happy? So that's what the good karma diet is I all about. I love it. I love it. You know, uh, we do have some questions. I've, I sent this out to my mailing list. And a lot of people are asking the same question because I love the way you said in your introduction you're an obesity survivor. And, you know, I've only known you about five years. But to look at you now, you're as big as a minute. And I have... I had so much trouble believing you were ever overweight that I insisted you sent me a picture before this podcast. <laughs> I just didn't feel I could say it because you are so tiny. Would you mind talking a little bit about that and, and when you when you became the survivor of obesity? It's been about 30 years now that you have not struggled with your weight at all, right? Yeah, that's why the picture I sent you looks so ridiculous. <laughs> I said it. I was one of the keynote speakers for Speaking of Women's Health. It was a big women's health expo that went all around the country, and they sent me to 14 different cities, and they wanted the before picture and all that. And this was when we were still you know, sending pictures that were paper. And mm -hmm. when they sent it back, they had named it Hefty Hippie. So it was a while. But no, really, being a food addict defined my life. I was an infant or toddler when I started turning to food for solace. I mean, I can't wow. remember when I ever didn't do that. And it was complicated by the fact that my parents were both in the weight loss industry. My dad as a physician who had turned from ear, nose, and throat into being a diet doctor. And my mom worked in what they used to call reducing salons that were kind of the precursors to health clubs, except you didn't exercise there. You got into these machines and I contraptions I that moved you about. Them. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. And I love Lucy. I remember seeing one of those contraptions. On yeah, that's movie. exactly the, the kind of thing. And so I was a fat kid, and I was bad for business. And it hurt me because I knew that there was something wrong with me. And the other thing, just historically, that's so interesting is at that time, kids weren't fat. I was either the only fat kid in the school or there was one other one. Yeah. And we would always be best friends regardless of what grade we were in or if he was a boy or she was a girl. It didn't matter. It was just we were tight because we had this this thing of, of being ostracized 
And I can remember once when I was nine going into my dad's private office and getting up on a chair and pulling down this big nutrition textbook that he had had in medical school. And I couldn't understand any of it except one chart. And it's very similar to what you can find today in any Whole Foods market, the Andy scores of food, Mm -hmm. foods by nutrient density. I believe Dr. Joel Furman has put that together. But this was in my dad's 1935 medical textbook. And the really scary thing was that the most nutrient-dense foods, the kale, the collard greens, the mustard greens, the arugula, the Swiss chard, I had never seen or heard of. Mm -hmm. When it got down to spinach, I knew that Popeye and I had both had that from a can, (laughs) but all this other stuff was foreign food to me. And so um, when I was 17, I got into yoga, and I heard about vegetarians and managed to do that. Uh, By the time I was 19, still did not manage to get rid of any other animal products because I was a practicing binge eater mm-hmm. and needed to go go within and really treat that condition as I would alcoholism or drug addiction or anything else of that nature. So I went into recovery, and I would say to anybody listening, if you're one of those people who, who is a binge eater or a one bite is too many and a thousand aren't enough – where it's really kind of got you by the throat, I would so recommend a program like Overeaters Anonymous, which doesn't cost anything, and they don't tell you what to eat. It works on the inside. So for me, once the inside was taken care of and I had the power of choice back about what to choose to eat, that was when I opted to go vegan. And lots of people nowadays say, yeah, but vegans can eat all this junk food. Not in 1983. There was no vegan junk food. So at that time... If you went vegan, you had to eat fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, nuts, seeds, and if you were really going to go wild and crazy, you could have a planter's peanut bar because that was the only thing out there in the junk food uh, world that vegans could eat. Yeah, that, that, that's so true. We have some kind of parallel lives. We're both Aries. We went vegan about the same time. I had suffered from food addiction as well. And, and when we were talking about school, I remember in the 60s, I was the only fat kid. Now you go around and there's plenty of them, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's a childhood obesity epidemic. And it's so interesting to me that some people say it started in 1980, which is kind of interesting because that was really just about when I was getting into being (laughs) on the other side of the problem was when the rest of the world changed. Maybe you're like that too, that when the world is doing one thing, you're doing something different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think about 1980 and what had happened societally So we'd had processed foods for then about 30 years. They started right after World War II in in great bulk and abundance. Fast food had come on the scene. Lots of um, processed foods that were easy to make. Women were working, so June Cleaver wasn't home making food for the family the way she had been uh, a decade or, or two earlier. Um, more conveniences, families had two cars, people were doing more sitting, television had been around for quite a while and was very much um, part part of the culture. And people started talking about this grazing thing where you're supposed to eat all day long. And I can just say as a, a compulsive eater in recovery, if somebody told me to eat six or eight times a day, I mean, it's just like my problem was never starting. It was stopping. Yeah, I, I, and if I only start three times, I only have to stop three times. So that's been helpful for me. Good point. So do you do you still participate in any of these recovery programs or are you cured? Well, you know, we're supposed to be anonymous. <laughs> And so uh, it's the kind of thing where anybody, you know, can kind of read between the lines. But a compulsive eater, just like an alcoholic, uh, is never cured. This is, in my opinion, and also the the, uh, belief of of, of people who do have a recovery sensibility in this way. So it's sort of like you meet a guy who hasn't had a drink in 40 years, and he says, I'm an alcoholic. And you say, no, you're not. You don't even drink. But if he did, you know, it could be lost weekend. 
So I, to this very day, am very grateful in knowing that I have a a day-at-a-time recovery that if I didn't do certain things to maintain some kind of spiritual fitness, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't go out and, and start buying drugs on the street corner. I wouldn't go pick up a sailor. Because that's just not my style. Those aren't my addictions. Food is. And I could conceivably go back to it. And and when I say that, it's like, really? Mm Because you just have this whole other life now. Well, I know that. But I also know my nature. And um, there are certain things that I need to do in terms of just remembering who and what I am, uh, engaging in, in some meditation, uh, remembering that I am not really the um, ultimate authority in the universe in all things. And I think one of the other really, really powerful tools that's helped me so much in, in my life since um, having my wonderful uh, daily reprieve from uh, killing myself with a fork is the ability to make amends that whenever I screw up, I have learned to deal with that fairly quickly, and there's just something so freeing about not carrying around these burdens of, oh, oh, that thing I did, oh, boy, what should I do to fix that? I fix it right now, and then, I don't know, it just helps. It helps Mm -hmm. to make life work a lot better. Well, I like that you mentioned your, that you have a lot of spiritual practices that really are important to make sure that you don't go back to this dark side of overeating. I'm I'm reading a book by Marianne Williamson now called A Course in Weight Loss, and I've invited her to be on the podcast. And she, you know, even though she's never, I don't think, been overweight herself, she talks about how this really is a spiritual problem, not really a food problem. Well, I think it's both. And one of the things that, that I tell people, I mean, I teach a class for Main Street Vegan Academy where I'm trying to help these about-to-be vegan lifestyle coaches understand a problem that very few people understand who haven't had it. And Mm -hmm. this includes medical doctors and psychologists. And that is that there are three kinds of people with food or weight issues. And the first group are people who have a weight issue because they eat the standard American diet, um, they like food, maybe. Maybe they don't know what else to eat. Maybe they don't get much exercise. And people like that, with some support and education, they're the people who say, I saw forks over knives, and now my whole life has changed, and I dropped 30 pounds, and my cholesterol went down 50 points, and you know, and good for them. This is yeah. fantastic. But then you've got your Category 2 person, and this is someone, usually a woman, and very often a woman who is quite educated about food and nutrition, and maybe she eats a, a pretty healthy diet most of the time, but the boyfriend gets angry, the boss says something mean, a disappointment happens, and then she's going for the haagen mm-hmm. So somebody like that needs a little bit deeper support, um, some behavioral modifications, some other tools for like taking care of themselves. Like, you know, maybe you need to call a friend, maybe you need to take a walk, maybe you need to take a bubble bath, you know, all that sort of thing. And there is a lot of help for people like that out in the world. Janine Roth is a wonderful author mm-hmm. who addresses this kind of person. And she'll say, you know, if you're really feeling bad and a cookie would make you feel better, Eat the cookie. That's mm-hmm. part two. Now, yeah. but, but number three, group three is me. That's the I'm compulsive. Gonna, I think I'm going to be in your group for some reason. Well, no, I, I love having you in any group <laughs> I'm in, although this one isn't, you know, the most yeah. pleasant until one finds a way out. Because I but, didn't but resonate group, with one and two yet, so I'm sure I'm going to be in three. <laughs> well, group three is the food addict. Yeah, and, and the best analogy I know is you've got a rubber band, and that's your willpower. And you're just stretching it, and it goes back, and you stretch it some more, and it goes back, and you stretch it, and one day it breaks. Well, what are you going to do now? It's broken. It's gone. And when a person gets to that stage where they really, they're eating when they don't want to be eating. They're they're eating foods that they intellectually and even emotionally don't want to be eating, but they're eating them anyway. That's when it gets into this area of, of spiritual malady. 
there was a, a beautiful phrase from Carl Jung, and he was talking about alcoholism, but I think the same thing applies. He said that you have to have a complete emotional displacement and rearrangement, something akin to a spiritual experience. Mm. And so the 12-step programs are designed to bring that about, other sorts of, of spiritual practice, maybe combined with some good therapy, um, can, can perhaps do that too. It's the idea that, that you have to be transformed. It's almost like that thing that St. Paul said, I think it was St. Paul, you know, be thou transformed by the renewal of your mind. Mm. And it's, it's the mind first. And then what is so cool for people who listen to your podcast and who know the kinds of things that you talk about then you have the ability to take all this great food information and use it. Because Mm -hmm. there's one thing, if you've never heard of healthy eating, to do, you know, something that you wish you hadn't. But if you know chapter and verse, if you've read all the books, if you've watched all the documentaries, and then you invade a 7-Eleven, that really gives you a level of demoralization that's just sad, and nobody should have to go through it. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I interview a lot of medical doctors on this show and also experts in food addiction, and you'd be surprised how many people still don't even believe it exists or it's real. I know. That's because they've never done it. And I think everybody believes that drug addiction exists, even people who have not so much as ever smoked a joint. They know drug addiction is real. But food addiction, because they eat... (laughs) You know, they do it every day. They have since they were children. And so it's very hard to to comprehend how a substance that you partake of with impunity could be so dangerous to somebody else. So, I, you know, I, I, OA sounds amazing. I've never, you know, gone to it because you mentioned they don't tell you what to eat, which is perfect, because then if you want to be on a plant-based diet, you can. But do they? do you have to weigh and measure? Do they tell you how much? Do they tell you to abstain from certain things like sugar and flour and alcohol? Or is it just whatever you want to make your food plan be? Well, there are some kind of offshoot groups that have different names. There, there's one called Gray Sheet and mm-hmm. one called OA plus, and I don't know, you know, stuff. It kind of happens in, in every movement. I think we have some of them in this uh, plant-based uh-huh. world as well. Um, but but if you just find a plain old regular OA group, and you can always call in advance and just say, what are you guys about? There are people in OA who weigh and measure their food. And, you know, if you're eating the standard American diet or standard American you foods, have yeah. That's a very good thing to do, yeah, because sure. you can't eat very much. I mean, how much meat and cheese and mashed potatoes and stuff like that can you eat and keep your weight where you want it? But when you start eating plant exclusive, I love, that's your phrase, yeah, you know. I heard that the first time from you. When you're on a plant exclusive diet, then you can actually eat enough to feel full and chew enough to feel satisfied. You know, mm. people who like to eat like to eat. We like tastes, we like smells, we like chewing, we like swallowing, we like feeling that fullness. And so if you're eating foods that are low in fat, low in caloric density, so that you can have enough of them, Mm -hmm. that's a nice thing. Sure. I agree. And and yes, and many people in OA do not use uh, sugar and um, flour or or refined flour, um, you know, which may be a very good idea for for anybody uh, looking to improve their health. Uh, Alcohol is, you know, certainly optional. I think some people believe that if you have an addictive personality, there may be um, a, a tendency to perhaps get addicted to more than one thing. So I think a lot of people avoid alcohol for that reason. Mm-hmm. I avoid alcohol because it always made me fall asleep and I was <laughs> never the life of the party. So, you know, we kind of find our own way in all this stuff. And this is what's so wonderful because you are the ultimate authority on your own life. And you can certainly get guidance from others, but um, you're going to have to figure out how to feed yourself. And once you do, it's going to be customized for you. 
Yeah, I like that. I like that. You have a really great YouTube called How to Be a Healthy Vegan. And one of the things you said in it was pretty groceries make pretty people. So is that, <laughs> is that why you're so lovely? Because you. you oh, you're so great. kind. You know where that whole pretty groceries thing came from? I was going through just a heck of a time in my life. It was it was the hardest time I've ever been through. I was a um, single mom. My, my husband had passed away suddenly. Uh-huh. And I... Uh, everybody said, don't do anything for a year. And so I didn't. And on day 366, I was so stir crazy that I thought my life would be easier if I moved to the country. Now I live in New York City, and here when people say the country, they mean like Brooklyn. But (laughs) I was living in Kansas City. And there, when we say the country, we mean the serious country. So I moved to a little cabin about three miles outside a town in the central Missouri Ozarks. That was the country. Now, I had no skills for living in the country. I didn't know what I was doing down there, but I didn't know how to find the grocery store. And the first night, I went and bought all the beautiful vegan food like I was eating by by that time. And the woman at the grocery store stopped the belt She looked at me and she said, I've had this job near 15 years, and I had never seen such pretty groceries. And I thought, aw, you know, I still have something going for me, pretty groceries. (laughs) And you know what? The whole rest of my life from then until now has been built on that. Yeah. Well, you have such a good fat. You always look so nice, not just because you're pretty, but you're, you're like, do you have somebody dress you? I have to, you just, so, <laughs> you are so stylish. You just always look Oh, so you're nice. so sweet. You're so um, I mean, I just, oh, you just look, you look so good. Just, just you're put together and you're so eloquent and you're just, you're just, you know, if, if you looked up lovely in the dictionary, I think your picture would be there. So oh. yeah. how do you look so good all the time? Somebody must dress you, right? You have such a good sense of style. Uh, yeah, right. I have the budget for a dresser. <laughs> Not yet. I, I have I have a dresser. It's in my bedroom with uh, socks in it. No, I was raised largely by um, a grandmother figure who was a nanny. She was hired to take care of me because both my parents worked and it was before daycare. And she was such a wonderful woman. She brought me up on a lot of interesting ideas about spirituality and Eastern religions and things that most little girls in Kansas City at that time were not getting. And she would quote Emerson and and misquote him. And then she would quote the Bible and misquote that. And one of her favorite quotations was, the Bible says that your body is a temple and you're (laughs) supposed to decorate it. So I really thought that, you know, clothes were kind of sacramental. Mm -hmm. And I'm fascinated now that I've been a a vegan for a really long time by vegan fashion. There's Mm -hmm. a just charming young man who has a a blog for men called The Discerning, Discerning Brute. And he also has a fashion line, a menswear fashion line called Brave Gentle Man. And he teaches for Main Street Vegan Academy. So I get to hear him four times a year talk about the history of animal use and abuse in fashion, not just using animal skins and pelts and parts for clothing, but also how the fashion industry uses them in in advertising and and in imagery. And if if anybody is thinking, what, what, I don't know that, what does that mean? Just go to a newsstand and look at the cover of the current Harper's Bazaar. For anybody who has an interest in, in animal rights or animal issues, it's actually shocking. And yet this is an industry that that has believed for a hundred years at least that these kinds of images help sell clothing so for me now my interest in fashion isn't just a little hobby and and fun it's also part of my ethical stance Mm -hmm. and i feel that just as i think it's important for those of us who are ethical vegans to be healthy and and shine that light for people who are looking on and saying hmm wonder if i'd ever want to do that 
I think it's also great to say yes, and we don't have to wear a sackcloth and black cotton uh, mouse shoes without any soles. You know, there's really yeah. great clothing we can find. That's funny because I wear these boots that are made in Panama that I get a lot of compliments on. They're very unique. No two pairs are alike. And that's just my personality to like unique things. But I also wear them because everywhere I go and I travel every week to a different city, they go, I love your boots. And the first thing I say is, well, they're vegan. You know, I use yeah. that. I always use that as a way to usually have a necklace or a T-shirt on, too. But I always use that as a way to open the door because here they've said these are the greatest boots I've ever seen. I go, well, that's because they're vegan. I always make sure yes. I, I do that because it's fun <laughs> and, and it's well, true. And, oh, our lives are so parallel because I have a boot story like that, too. I, I went to Moose Shoes, um, which is a animal free shoe store here in New York City. There's now one in L.A. as well. And there were these unbelievable boots i mean they were these gorgeous over the knee ultra suede black mm-hmm. boots wedge heel and when you fold down the tops they have these periwinkle cuffs mm-hmm. and it was just like oh my god this is just too gorgeous and then i looked at the price and it's like okay no we we don't do this but then I was on the subway going home, and God talks to me, which sometimes happens. Mm-hmm. And God said, Victoria, and I said, yes. And he said, you are almost too old for black ultra suede over-the-knee boots with periwinkle cuffs. Almost. So get it now. Not quite. <laughs> act before it is too late. So I went back the next day and bought the boots, and I have the same experience that you do. And it's kind of funny. It just kind of depends on the neighborhood, whether I get uh, those are very attractive boots or ooh, cool boots or whoa mama and whatever <laughs> I get it's like they're vegan <laughs> thank you and they're vegan so fun so that's so cool that Michael Moore endorsed your last book but he's not yeah. think there's any hope for him to go vegan because he's such I a do. Great film you know if he you know his documentary sicko was such a great uh synopsis of the failings of our healthcare industry if he if he would could just do a documentary on on you know veganism uh, his work is so amazing it would be so cool if we could have him on the team i know well he had an experience over a piece of bison and this was now about 6 years ago he was at a, a fancy restaurant and he ordered this buffalo steak and it was supposed to be so wonderful but when it showed up, he could not eat it. There was the presence of being was there in such a way that he just literally didn't eat it. And he went home thinking, well, maybe I'm getting the flu or something. But the next day, he couldn't eat red meat or what I like to call the flesh of four-footed animals that day either or the next day or the next and he has not eaten the flesh of four-footed animals in all that time. Now, he has tried to be vegan and has had varying degrees of success, which, you know, it took me 12 years after Mm -hmm. I heard the word to actually make it. Um, And the last I heard from him, he had been in um, Europe um, working on a film and said, boy, the, the food over there is sure different, which, you know, I found myself, I just spent some time in Paris and it, whoa, it took a while to figure out how to get the kind of food that I wanted over there. But he had said, you know, now I'm back in New York, you know, back on track. And I don't know exactly what that means because we're, we're not, you know, like hanging out all the time, but I do know that he knows about it, and and I had dropped off a a copy of The Good Karma Diet for him and also a copy of Melanie Joy's book, Why We. Oh, good one. Okay. I always get the order wrong. Why We Eat Pigs, Wear, (laughs) Love Dogs, Eat Pigs and Wear Cows. That's it. Um, and, and, you know, he did write back after that and said, I will read both books. Oh, my gosh, your friend's book sure has a fun title. Yeah. So he, he's very aware. And you know the book that he really, really liked, the vegan book, if oh. I can say this word on, on your show? Sure. John Joseph's Meat is oh, for Pussy. Oh, yeah, I love that Meat is for he, he was on my television show. I love John Joseph. Oh, yeah. he, John Joseph is just, oh, I mean, he is something else. He, he teaches for the Academy as well, and he's so real. You just can't listen to him and not have great respect for not only him, but for everybody who is attempting to live the kind of quality life that he's living. 
because it takes a lot of discipline, you know, to, to be an athlete and do all the things that that he does. And every time I, I hear him, I, it just makes me want to be a better person. Yeah, he, he's, he's extraordinary. So you mentioned Main Street Vegan Academy. Tell our listeners what it is. Oh, bless you. Well, it's it actually got a little bit of a Michael Moore story for, for that, too, because when the publisher – wanted this book that I was going to write called Main Street Vegan. We're back in, in 2012 now. And, and they said, you know, we're so happy to be working with you, love the concept, but we hate Main Street. It sounds like the Tea Party. And I'm thinking, well, gosh, you know, people in the Tea Party have arteries too. What's wrong with that? Mm-hmm. But they just didn't like the title. So I actually ran into Michael Moore on the street and he was the one who talked with the people at the publishing house and convinced them to let me have my title. Nice. And once my editor called me after this and said, okay, it's Main Street Vegan, it was just like I had this barrage of ideas of, oh, there needs to be a Main Street Vegan podcast. And then, <laughs> you know, and one idea that just so stuck in addition to the, the podcast was Main Street Vegan Academy training and certifying vegan lifestyle coaches and educators. So we started in um, June of 2012. We just finished our um, 12th class. Nice. And we have now 175 um, certified vegan lifestyle coaches and educators in nine countries. So what happens when people come here, and this is an in-person program in New York City, and people say you should put it online. And it's like, no, if you want to go to Harvard, you get yourself to Massachusetts. Sure. And and part of of the, I think, magic of the whole thing is it is an effort. I mean, it's if you don't live near here, if you've come from certainly Australia or South Africa, where people have actually come from, it's something to get here. But when you do... You get classes from some of the most dynamic, committed, and helpful people in this movement, and they're so generous. We have uh, Dr. Ostfeld from Montefiore. I um, love him. Cardiac wellness. He is fabulous. Um, he comes on the first night. We have uh, Marty Davy, La Diva dietitian. Um, who does two uh, in-depth classes in plant-based nutrition for us and then offers her services. She said, you know, if you're going to be out helping people but you're not nutritionists or dietitians or whatever, questions are going to come up, call me. So mm. it's like everybody has a dietitian on speed dial after right. they leave that they can refer back to. And we cover every aspect of being vegan and then how, how to communicate that to others. So we have classes in, in coaching techniques and working with mixed and transitional families and all this. And then we have um, capitalization, how to turn this into a business. And people are doing remarkable things. Many are are coaching and teaching, and others have businesses. We have uh, Kat Mendenhall in Dallas uh, started a vegan cowboy boot company, and uh, we have a young woman in Toronto um, who has Pleasant Valley Creamery uh, making vegan ice cream. A a woman here in New York City is going to be opening uh, an all-plant-based Fromagerie in Brooklyn. So um, the the sky is the limit, and maybe there's no limit at all. So when's the next class? How many people are in the program, and how can our listeners find out about it? Oh, you're so kind. We have two more in um, 2015. So we have one coming in August and one in October. These are boutique programs, so we can take a maximum of 16 people in each class. So you get a lot of individual attention. You get a lot of time with me. And then we have fabulous field trips. So you get to go out in New York right. City, which some people say is Disneyland for vegans. Well, that's we funny. All kinds of, that's, hmm? that's, I don't mean to interrupt, but it's so funny that we're really thinking alike. Because when you just said Disneyland for vegans, when I think of your title, Main Street, the first thing that comes to mind when I think of Main Street is Disneyland. <laughs> yeah, isn't it because true? That, that's when you enter the park of the happiest place on earth, the first thing. Yes. <laughs> And being vegan is like the happiest way of being on earth. And so that's how oh, it's I feel when I think it's of such it. a happy man. Anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you say no, no. like we're thinking the same thing, but that sounds amazing. I mean, to get that much time with you, 16 people, that sounds like incredible. It, it, it's really amazing to me. And every time it happens, I get to witness 
this incredible transformation because all these people who have never met each other before show up. The one thing they have in common is this, they're all vegan. And some of them come from a very health conscious place and their primary motivation is health. Some are very much invested in animals. Some of those people are healthy eating vegans. Some of them come and, you know, they're not so much into the health just yet. And, and from all different walks of life, and they make this incredible bond with their classmates, but then we also connect them with all the other graduates. So we have a master list by location and, and day job and interest so people can find other people um, who have something in common with them. And we've got people working together. A couple of our graduates have come back to be instructors, J.L. Fields. A lot of people know her blog, J.L. Goes Vegan, does a class for us on taking your your outreach into the corporate world. And she's had a great deal of success um, as a consultant for various companies and, and corporations who want their people to be healthier or their products to be healthier. And we have a young man that does one of our uh, marketing courses, and he was actually tapped by the Shark Tank TV show to write their business books. So one of his cool. uh, Shark, Shark Tank Jumpstart Your Business is out in the world, and he's just written another one for them. So these are the kind of people that we have. And, and then these graduates are just stunned because on the one hand, it's very intimate. I mean, we do this in my home other than, you know, the field trips. Uh -huh. And so it's kind of laid back and somebody's giving a lecture and I'm in the kitchen making lunch. So there's that almost little kind of funky, okay, I'm doing this thing and it's in somebody's house. And yet the quality of the information that they get and the amount of inspiration, it's just like, oh, my God. It sounds beyond amazing. The beyond. What's the website if people want to find out more about it? MainStreetVegan.net. .net. There okay. they can just click on Academy. Yes, somebody else has the .com, and they haven't done anything with That's it, great. so we're .net and doing fine. So you said you cover um, just about everything in this program. Do you ever cover, and I don't know what you would call this topic, but uh, – P vegans that are mean to other vegans and I and I <laughs> and the reason I want to ask you this is like a race to Cora type question for Summerfest but I'm not going to see her for a few months so I'm going to ask you because I bet you would know how to handle it because you're a very kind person I have a, a, a client who's disabled physically disabled in a wheelchair multiple medical problems and she has a service dog and she's vegan and she finds when she goes to veg fest people are very mean to her because there's a lot of, I guess we would call them abolitionist vegans that believe that number one, we should not even have pets. And if we do that service dogs are slavery. And as somebody who was severely disabled with a service dog for 10 years, I couldn't disagree more. And if that happened to me, I'd be ripping them. Well, you know, they, I'm an Aries. Mm -hmm. they, that wouldn't happen to me. So, so I, what advice do you have for, for this? Because not, I mean, not all vegans are as loving as we would hope, you know, sometimes to, to even other vegans. And, and I'm so dismayed. Every time I hear that, every time I think about that, it makes me so sad. Mm -hmm. I think the only positive thing in there is that this movement is growing. When I got into this, there were so few vegans that when I did my college thesis, and I, I went to college late, um, but I wanted to study vegans, so I went to England because that was a smaller landmass, and that was the only place to find enough vegans to study. And so now we're great big. I mean, we're obviously not big enough to change the world yet, but we're big. I mean, we're a, a movement to be reckoned with. And so whenever anything gets to be that large, you're going to get people who are mean and who are weird and who are hung up on one little fine point and ignore all the others. This is true in probably every religion, every political movement, all the human rights movements. So I don't think it's unique to vegans. It just hurts me more when it's vegans because mm -hmm. these are my people. Sure. And I want us to be really exemplary. There's a wonderful spiritual teacher who was vegetarian, vegan whenever possible. And the reason I say she couldn't be vegan all the time was that her name was Peace Pilgrim, and she walked around the country fasting until given food, walking until given shelter, and lecturing about how we'll never get world peace until we get inner peace. And she would always say, live up to the highest light you have, and more light will be given you. 
And obviously, these people who are unkind, certainly to a disabled person, but really to anybody, and mm-hmm. I see it more on Facebook than mm-hmm. in real life, because most people, you know, it actually takes some nerve to be rude in real life, yeah. <laughs> because the other person can talk back to you. But sure. the rudeness online, the unkindness online, it is, it's just sad. I know. But... I- I think it just means that those of us who are, you know, decent people most of the time just need to be out there more and and being maybe more vocal so that if somebody does say, oh, yeah, I knew a vegan once, it'll be one of us and not one of those people. Yeah, let's hope. Let's hope. I have an interesting question from Patty. She wanted to know, what is your favorite way to find tranquility? Oh, you know, I have an unusual answer to that probably because most people would say they want to go out in nature. Nature doesn't do it for me. Mm-hmm. I am just not an outdoor person. That's not where I find the most peace. So certainly I would find peace in a cathedral. In fact, I actually love cathedrals and I think about people in you know the 5th or 6th century or whenever they first started building cathedrals and how they lived these really rugged lives and then to walk into one of these magnificent structures with the vaulted ceilings and the stained glass it must have been so amazing because it lifts my spirit even now but you know I can just go to a coffee house I am very comforted in urban atmospheres with people around but people who don't want anything from me. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's hard for me these days in, in my life, I think it's probably if somebody said, you know, what what's what's a real negative in, in your life right now? I think one of them would have to be that because of email, particularly email, not so much social media because I'm not addicted to social media. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I have to be on that all the time. But I do have this idea that the email has to be cleaned up. But it will never be cleaned up because right. it just keeps on coming. I but know. when I go out to, to a, a cafe, people may still be wanting me on email, but nobody really wants me in that cafe. And I can just be there and and absorb some of that uplift and energy. It, and it goes into my writing. I remember when I first moved to New York City, I was writing one day in a Starbucks on the Upper West Side. And I looked out the window and a guy rode by on a unicycle, talking on his cell phone with Money. a cup of coffee in the other hand. And I thought, whoa, I'm really in New York. And just that image went into what I was writing, and it made it better, and it made me feel better. So, yeah, I'm kind of a, uh, I don't know what you call it, maybe a coffee house Christian. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, it's... um. That's that's a very uh, serenity making for me. Or eudaimonic. I learned that word in that spelling bee movie. You remember oh, I love about that. ten years ago, yep. that spelling bee. Eudaimonic means happy making, and I don't know why there isn't an easier word because we need a word for happy making. Mm. Veganism. Like, that's a word for happy making. Or or how is this to put it into a sentence? Hanging out with Chef AJ is a eudaimonic activity. <laughs> Love it. Are you? Do you meditate regularly and still do yoga? Oh, yes, I do both of those things. And I wish I could say, you know, oh, I meditate regularly. I never miss a day. I do miss a day. We had a, a couple in, in the last Main Street Vegan Academy course who do insight meditation, and they do it an hour a day. Oh. And, and they said one night when they were our first night, ended and then they'd have to come back early the next morning and they said yeah we're going to go back to the hotel and meditate for an hour and I'm thinking I wouldn't do that so Mm -hmm. I don't have that kind of dedication but I am trained in TM and you know I wanted to do that when I was a teenager and $40 was too much and then it was 300 and that was too much and by the time I finally did it oh my gosh it was really expensive but forget it you know I try to get my money's worth and in TM they tell you to do it twice a day Mm -hmm. and I've never gotten a consistent 
afternoon meditation practice. But I'm, I'm fairly consistent with morning. And yoga, yes, I'm so excited, Chef AJ. I have to tell you the coolest thing has happened. I have discovered aerial yoga. Oh, wow. I and it makes me so happy. It's, it's fun. And I get fun. It's really fun. It is super fun. And I'm not somebody who really likes exercise. In fact, I kind of really don't like it. It's one of those things like you floss, you go to the gym with an equal amount of enthusiasm. Uh But oh my gosh, this aerial yoga, all I can say is that when I'm upside down, the world seems right side up. Neat. Oh, that's great. You know, I remember a couple years ago, I was introducing you in Marshall, Texas at the Health Fest, and it looked to me like before you were going on, like you were doing some like meditation to get ready. Well, I love the process of speaking. I think the whole art of oratory is is really kind of overlooked. Maybe the TED Talks are bringing back that appreciation some. But I, I love getting myself in the right zone before getting up to speak to a group of people. And so there are some little techniques that I do, some vocal exercises, some visualization. And, you know, and I actually pray. I I just say, you know, help me help somebody. You know, help me say something in this talk that is going to change somebody's life. I don't have that power in myself. I would just hope to be used as a vehicle uh, to make that happen. So, yeah, I do a little bit of that before I uh, get up to talk to the people. Well, you are a terrific speaker. I remember hearing you at Summerfest, and you're going to be at Summerfest this year also. People want to yes. hear you. Great. Love Summerfest. Yeah, like, Summer camp. Yeah. Well, you do so many things. As, as my English friend would say, you've got your finger in a lot of pies. You run this academy. Mm-hmm. You have a radio show. You've written many best-selling books. You're a sought-after speaker. Is there anything that you like to do the most or that brings you the most joy, or you just love all of it? I love all of it. The speaking it brings me the most joy. Mm. There is, if I didn't have to get on an airplane and, you know, be irradiated and take the shoes off and all that stuff to get there, I would just like to be speaking all the time. Although now I, I do have a dog. And oh, so what I kind of dog? Like... I love dogs. That's oh, right. he's, he's a little foundling, a, a rescue. He is a schnoodle, I'm told, <laughs> a schnauzer poodle, little Forbes. And so I guess I wouldn't want to be on the road all the time. I'd have to leave Forbes. But just the idea of being able to speak every day, oh, I mean, just be still my beating heart. That just seems like the coolest thing ever. Now, writing is interesting. Writing is fabulous sometimes. Mm -hmm. And other times, it's just work. You just have to get there and sit with it until something flows. So that's a wonderful way to live a life and make a living, but it's not easy with the um the speaking. It's instant gratification yes. because the yep. audiences are so warm and and what I tell people I I actually teach a public speaking class for the academy and and I say that they want you to do well. They want to enjoy you. And sometimes to me, and you've probably had this happen too, somebody will come up to you and say, oh, you know, what you said about leafy greens, that changed my life. Oh, my gosh, I'd never really thought about leafy And you're thinking, wait a minute, did I talk about leafy greens in that talk? And you're going, I don't think I even mentioned But people hear what they need. Yeah, and exactly. it's pretty mystical and magical. So, you know, I happen to – I love uh, – uh, and acronyms very much uh, acronyms. So I'm I'm adding an extra syllable. And you have a kind of a fun one in your new book, Good Karma Diet for Vegan. Do you want to say what it is, or can I say it? Because I really like it. Yeah. Well, so many people don't like the word vegan, maybe because of the unkind vegans you were talking about. But um, James McWilliams, the wonderful um, environmentalist and, and professor from Texas, has said. Vegan is a very hopeful word, and I really believe that. I think it stands for for living with integrity and and kindness and selflessness and good sense. 
So I do like the word, and I have an acronym. The first is validate your choices, which means learn some stuff. Learn what you need to know about nutrition and about how to take care of yourself so you can do this properly and sanely. Then E in the word vegan is embody a healthy life. And a lot of people, as as we said, get into this, and health is not their motivation, and it certainly doesn't have to be anybody's primary motivation. But if you're not healthy, you can't help anybody for the extended period so you want to embody good health and then g in the word vegan is get to know others who are also doing this because there's some statistic came out a few months ago that 85 percent of people who stop eating animal products go back which is just kidding that awful statistic and and in my experience they'll say things like well i felt weak or I craved eggs, or my doctor said, or whatever they say. But if you dig a little bit deeper, you find out that it's something social. It's a relationship. Either Uh the spouse is not handling it very well, or a new boyfriend comes into the scene, or, you know, the brother-in-law just won't stop ribbing. Whatever it is, it's usually something social. So if you get to know people who are also doing this, you have a support group. And Probably you can find somebody locally just because there are enough of us now that we're kind of everywhere, but certainly online there are lots of people to be supportive. Then A in the word vegan is my favorite because that is add more to your life than you subtract. Mm -hmm. Because one of the unfortunate things about when people say, oh, you're vegan, what does that mean? And then it's this big negative diatribe, well, we don't eat this and we don't do that, when really you can add wonderful new foods that you've never heard of before, different kinds of ethnic dishes, and then all the vegan fashion. I mean, there's just so much to add. And then N is never forget the animals. Because just like I talked about some people come in and they're not really thinking about health, some people come in and they're not really thinking about animals. But those people who, who go back, the people who make that recidivism rate so high, are generally people who came in for their health but we're so indoctrinated in this culture with the diet mentality of, oh, come on, a little bit won't hurt you, just this time. Mm-hmm. Eh, it's a weekend. And so <laughs> if if you come in with that kind of, of attitude, then it's like, oh, you know, a little salmon. And, oh, I heard that doctor on TV who said that's really good. You know, eat lots of plants, but then eat some of this and some of this and some of this. And before you know it, it's all gone. But if you get the animal piece, you come to see that, okay, maybe for my health, if I just have one thing every now and then, it won't make such a difference. But that one thing to that animal is life and death and yep. all and everything. I no, I know. Uh, you know, I, I think when people do it for more than one reason, it's even, it has more stick to you know? I heard that today. Somebody said, I think somebody on, on Twitter maybe, yeah. had said that somebody did a study that, that people who have more than one reason are, are the most likely to stay right. with it. Because I initially went vegan completely for ethical reasons, even though for the first 26 years I was fat and sick and a junk food vegan, but that never left me. I didn't then become a vegan for health and then decided you know, to not be ethical as well. But now because, I mean, and not that I don't care about the environment, but because I have two strong whys, it, you know, even if one somehow fell to the wayside, which I don't think it would, it's just, you know, I can't imagine ever not being vegan. It's been almost 40 years and it seems to be working. So, you know. Oh, that's so cool. Well, the environment is very interesting because some people would say, well, that's the most important thing of all. Because if the environment goes, it doesn't matter how healthy you are, everybody's going to die. And it doesn't matter how good you are to animals because they're going to die too. And, and that's perfectly logical. And yet, my cholesterol level is a very solid thing. I get that. I understand what I need to do to keep that where it needs to be. When I see a a video of of animal cruelty or or I go to a farm sanctuary and, and I hang out with these wonderful rescued animals, that's very real to me. That speaks to my heart. And the environment, you know, I don't live in California where there's a drought. So I look out my window and it's like the environment looks fine. So that's more of an intellectual construct for me. The animals and the health get down a little bit more 
personally. And mm-hmm. so those are the things that keep me vegan, but, you know, I'm helping the environment too. That's the cool thing. It, it doesn't really matter why you're doing it because as long as you're doing it, you're helping everything. That's true. That's true. That's why when, when I've had some um, ethical vegans say, well, if you're not vegan for an animal, don't be vegan. I'm like, really? Because last time I checked, they didn't care why we didn't eat them. So it's, there's never exactly. a bad reason. Never a bad reason to be vegan. You know, one of the things I loved in your book where you you had a chapter before you feed yourself, nourish yourself, you talked about cravings. And that's something I'm always interested in because you, you said even a minute ago that sometimes people just, they let it slip a piece of salmon here or there. And you said oftentimes people give up on plant-based eating because they have a craving for eggs or dairy cheese and they believe this indicates some nutritional deficit. That's not it. Cravings are most often vestiges of past love. Loves. Tell me you've never seen a picture of an old flame and gotten fluttery all over again, even if said ex left you in misery. It's the same with food. If grandma placated you with chocolate pudding or your nostalgic college days were punctuated with pizza, you're going to crave those foods when you're short on comfort or excitement or some other life nutrient. They don't just stock at Trader Joe's. I thought that was really, I love that paragraph. I mean, because I, I, I create, a lot of times people think, well, you know, I have a craving for meat, therefore my body must need meat. But no. Well, this whole craving thing, I I think, has gotten kind of out of hand in in certain health circles because there there is a belief extant that if you crave something, it means you need it, unless you crave sugar. If you crave sugar, it means you need protein or you need something else because sugar is bad, so that craving doesn't mean that. But if you crave eggs or if you crave cheese or if you crave something else, then that means your body is crying out for that and you really need it. But I say there are people whose bodies are crying out for crack and whose minds are crying out to spend the night with their best friend's wife. I mean, it doesn't mean you need it. It means you crave it. And I think we have to get very clear about what's what and just because we want to indulge in something and you know the interesting thing too is when when you stay away from something you don't crave it and you have it that one time and if it is something that that is you know kind of addictive either because of what's in it or just because of its flavor or its texture or the memories attached to it then having it that one time that one piece of salmon or whatever it is it is going to make you want it more. I mean, that's how you can always tell if you're addicted to something. I mean, yeah. for a long time, I was drinking those chai teas at, at Starbucks, mm-hmm. and then I found out how much sugar they had in them, and I was just horrified. I Because you know, people would say, do you eat sugar? And I'd say, oh, no, of course not. I don't eat sugar. <laughs> no, no, no. And then it was just like, oh, my God, what I've been doing to myself many mornings of the week. And how I knew when I stopped those that that was really a a habit pattern that needed to be stopped was that I just expected one. I mean, I didn't have them all day long, but I had one in the morning, and then I needed one the next morning and the next morning. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people are like that about coffee, and, you know, there's some good stuff about coffee. And if somebody's into it and, and, and likes that, then more power to them. I read one study that some people get most of their antioxidants from coffee because they're not you know, getting it from any other food. But the fact is, if you need it every single morning, then it's a dependency. And I don't want to be dependent on anything except, you know, good right. friends and uh, the sure. good life. Sure. Well, um, I love your book, The Good Karma Diet. I hope people will run out and get it. And there's also some great recipes in it. I have not made in yet, them yet because I just got the book at the beginning of the week, but I have little post-its in it. And the first one I'm going to make is something called Boldly Brilliant Borscht because it just sounded really good. So The, the, woman, the young woman who did the recipes, um, she's from Toronto, and, and she's fascinating. She's traveled all around the world to all these tropical places where some of these superfoods grow that by the time we get them over here are like $86 a pound or something. But she's actually experienced them from the tree, and she has a a Russian background and learned to make borscht from her mother and has uh, veganized it and healthified it, and it's real good. 
real pretty too. Yes, Diane, that's great. Well, we're almost out of time. So one of the questions I want to ask you, and I want to end by reading a paragraph from your book that was my favorite in the whole book. It's not even at the end. It's just something that really inspired and jumped out to me. But what I want to ask you is something I ask a lot of my guests is who inspired you the most? It doesn't have to be necessarily, you know, somebody living. It could be, you know, somebody just, you know, like for me, it's Victor Frankl. I never met him. So, oh, wow. you know, um, you know, uh, Rosa Parks, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's your parents. So just, I just love to get to know my guests a little bit more about like what, what makes Victoria tick? Like who really oh, made you? Sure. Yeah. Oh, well, first I just, I, I was talking about the recipe creator and I didn't give her name. Her name is Doris Finn and oh. she's Feed Your Bliss on the internet. So if anybody wants to look her up, she's Feed Your Bliss. Okay. The person who really inspired me was this woman who was hired to live with us and take care of me when I was six months old. And probably if my parents had known how eccentric and individualistic she was, they would have hired somebody else. But she really gave me the foundation for the life that I have now. She was the first person to ever tell me that vegetarians existed in the world. She raised me to care about animals, to rescue animals. Now, my own daughter is a lifelong vegan, a wildlife rehabilitator, and a stunt performer because we're not wimpy vegans. So I would say Dee Dee, this this woman who has uh, not been alive for a very long time but who lives in me every single day. Very nice, very nice. So let me tell you the paragraph that I loved, and it's not even at the end of the book, it's towards the end, though, um, page 217, and it says this. Changing what you eat is the first step, the easy one. Then you have to open your heart, not just the physical arteries that we know can open on this kind of diet, but the metaphorical heart, the one that can draw in enough compassion for animals and people, too. The superior food you're eating will nourish you, but that love will sustain you. It will keep you on track and give you the most glorious gifts, the ability to affect positive change in the world and the grace not to measure the scope of your influence, but simply be grateful to have some. And I kind of think that almost sums up the book in a lot of ways, that one paragraph. Well, thank you. I love that phrase about opening your heart. Many years ago, I, I met Dean Ornish. His ah, nice. work had, had been published in the scientific journals, but his, his book uh, for, for the public had not yet come out. And he told me that he wanted to call it Opening Your Heart. And the publisher said, oh, no, no, we're going to call it Dr. Dean Ornish's Program for Reversing Heart Disease. <laughs> and so a lot of people don't know that Dean Ornish came to this whole thing from a yogic path. He was mm -hmm. a devotee of, of Swami Satchitananda, learned about being vegetarian, and, and really saw that this whole thing that we're about is really about opening one's heart physically and metaphysically. So I think if, if we can just remember that, it's going to take us a long way. That well, you know, if if Dean Morris didn't get the title he wanted, why didn't he have Michael Moore contact the publisher? <laughs> <laughs> it seemed to work for you. Well, and it just went so fast talking to you. We're just such kindred spirits, and I'm just we excited are. to see you. And next month at Summerfest is just actually about a month away. So if you guys don't have your tickets yet, please go to. Vegetarian Summerfest and hear Victoria and myself and a lot of other great speakers like John Pierre. And if people want to find out more about you, is there maybe just one main website to get on your newsletter and find out all that you're doing? Oh, thank you. Yeah, MainStreetVegan.net has everything. The newsletter subscription is at the very top. It says subscribe to the Main Street Minute. And you get a little, I think we call it a V-guide, <laughs> a little <laughs> tiny, uh, I don't want to say e-book. I don't like it when, when people say book when they don't mean a book. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, a little guide for joining. And I do this tiny little newsletter um, every Tuesday, uh, keep you all up to date on uh, yeah. and you what's happening that around here. I'm, I, I, you know, one of the things I did when I minimized and decluttered my life is unsubscribed from many of the newsletters, but I stayed on yours and I appreciate that you really don't send out that many and what you send out is good. So I really enjoy it. Thank you so much. Well, sure. And thank you for uh, being a guest on Healthy Living. It was just a pleasure Aww. to talk to you. This and was you so much fun. And knowing how busy people get at Summerfest, we've probably spent more time talking this evening than we will at Summerfest. Are, are you going to have your boots with you? I'd love to see those periwinkle cuffs. 
Ha, ha. Well, you know, it's summertime, so I, I probably won't have the boots, but, okay, you know, maybe wearing. I'll have something pretty. And I've seen your boots. I know the yeah. ones you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, so those pair. are famous gonna, boots. Yeah, I'm going to wear my boots. So thank you so much, Victoria. And everybody, run yeah. out and get The Good Karma Diet. It's a great book, as is Main, Main Street Vegan, as are all your books. You're just very prolific. I'm just so jealous. It took me forever to eke out one book, and I'm trying desperately for a second. But I agree with you. The speaking is way more fun. Because of the, I love the, just the energy from the crowd and everything. Writing is kind of more solid. Well, it's not, it is solitary. It's not like you're doing it in the group. So, yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. And thank all of you for listening to Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks, AJ.